A couple's dull marriage gets an unexpected shock when the husband and wife discover that they're both secret assassins from rival agencies. Listen as we discuss an easy way to kill killers, TV networks for women, and what Nicole Kidman might say about Halloween. Then we find out if Mr. and Mrs. Smith stands the test of time. Time James and Alan have their say. Do the movies you love still hold up today? James says gladiator with the glut. Alan says as a father, blah blah. It's the test of time. James and Alan have their say. Do the movies you love still hold up today? Test of time. James and Alan have their say. Do the movies you love still hold up today? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Test of Time. My name is Alan Noah, and your name is what again? I am Mr. Smith. No, that's not right. Your name is James Brief. That's right. I'm James Brief, and we run a podcast called The Test of Time. We run it? I mean, we are it. I run it. That's more correct, yeah. Oh, oh, sorry, sir. (laughs) I run this fucking podcast. What am I talking about? What the fuck? Shut up, James. You're fired. Yes, sir. All right, you're rehired. It would be boring just me talking to myself about Mr. and Mrs. Smith. But before we get into Mr. and Mrs. Smith, we were talking last week about the movies that we saw and didn't see in 2023. And then I saw this this op-ed from the Washington Post about the annoying thing about going to the movies. And it made me think of our conversation, and it also just made me laugh. It was written in December. It was still uh, making the rounds on social media recently. It's this opinion piece written by Richard Zoglin, and it's got a great fucking title. It's, When is this movie really going to start? I've been here half an hour. And the guy's got a fucking point. The short version of his point is that you pay money to go see a movie at a theater and you are still subjected to so much crap before you get to the movie. When you pay for Netflix, you don't have to watch commercials. That's like the reason people pay for it. I mean, I guess in addition to convenience and you pay a lot of money to go to the the movies. And I feel like it's kind of a thing that people sometimes complain about how many trailers they show. But, uh, you know, I kind of get that. I know you don't like trailers, but people like trailers, and that's going to get you back to the movie theater again, at least in theory. But the car commercials and the soda commercials and the whatever the fuck commercials that go on and on and on in these nonstop interviews, it's really fucking annoying. And for me, as someone who doesn't watch trailers, I love and I almost exclusively get uh, movies where I reserve my seats because if the movie starts at 8, I'll just walk in at like 8.15. That's when I get my snacks. And uh, But you're still going to watch 17 trailers if you get there at 8.15. Yeah, that, that's true, but I'll, I'll be the guy that's kind of like very, uh, very casually looking at my phone on the lowest uh, dimness, and I will put it away immediately when the last trailer is done. You know, it can bite you in the ass, though. There can be films that can start pretty quickly and you can miss the beginning. Well, yeah, and I think that's one of the annoying parts of it. I tend to be late. It is a character flaw It's not a great personality trait, but I don't mind running late to a movie because of this reason, but I do hate the fact that I don't really know for an eight o'clock movie. Can I get there at 830? Usually that's about right, but you don't want to get there and miss the first five minutes of, of a movie that fucking sucks. And in this op-ed at the end, the, the author writes that one potential solution for this problem is to list when the movie is actually going to start. If it's an eight o'clock movie, it should say underneath the movie itself starts at 8.30 or 8.25 or 8.35 or whatever it is, just so you can fucking plan. Well, they're not going to do that. Why would people pay for advertisement when they know nobody's going to watch it? That, that would really reduce the price that they could charge for advertising. No, they should incentivize it. If you show up at 8 o'clock and the person scans your your ticket or your QR code or whatever before 8 o'clock, then you get $5 off your next visit. Then you get a free popcorn. Then you get something. That's the way the world works now. You can get a tier of Hulu or Prime or uh, 
Peacock or whatever, where you pay less and you still have to watch some ads. Or you can pay more and not have to watch ads. That's what we're used to. I don't want to listen to ads when I listen to music, so I pay for Spotify Premium. If you don't want to pay for Spotify Premium, then you can listen to ads in your music. You have that choice. Movie theaters should follow that model, I think. Yeah, we've talked about this before. I, I mean, COVID really was the knockout punch that may or may not kill movie theaters. But you really have to make it an event, a real reason you get your butt out and you pay that 20 uh, whatever dollars. And we will pay it for two, two and a half hours of entertainment. You know, even my niece, uh, when she saw the Taylor Swift film, they literally did the, the whole friendship bracelets and they were singing. Yeah. It was an experience. And it's really yours to lose, movie theaters. Like It's not like airlines that can continue to fuck us over because what the fuck else are we going to do right you know we're just going to take it but we really have a lot of other options uh instead of going to the theaters and right. you know they're really they really got to make it a better uh, experience i don't think the ads are a problem i think 10 even 15 minutes are reasonable because people are also gonna be late you don't necessarily want to start an eight o'clock film at eight o'clock i think that's a good thing uh that they have something to watch and that the commercials are so much worse than trailers i don't watch trailers but i, I know when i used to like you hate watching a coca-cola commercial yeah and you know don't get started on that nicole kidman uh I, enough people trash on it we're not we're not going to go down that uh, uh, that road, I don't think. The Nicole Kidman thing doesn't bother me because one, it's short, and two, it's so, so fucking cheesy that it's funny. I don't know if I told you this, I went as Nicole Kidman for Halloween, but like specifically Nicole Kidman for AMC theaters. No, that's hysterical. I thought it was really funny. I wore a pantsuit and I wore a red wig and I carried an AMC bucket of popcorn and, you know, 2% of people got it. And the people who did get it thought it was really fucking funny. I wrote like a thing in her style about the movies, but I wrote one about Halloween and that I, I put that on Facebook with my picture of myself in the wig by AMC. I thought it was pretty funny. You want to hear it? Sure. Oh, uh, wait, let me pull it up. You know, while you pull it up, you know, I think AMC, to, to give them credit... I think the heart's in the right place by by what they were trying to do with the Nicole Kidman thing, by making you remember how magical a movie theater experience is. But it kind of failed so much because it's so cheesy. Uh, I get what they were trying to do, and that's what they have to do. You have to remind people that you're not getting the same experience by sitting at home and watching a comedy film than sitting with a hundred other people who are laughing simultaneously. Even people talking about Marvel films at certain epic parts that they liked. Everyone clapped and you're never going to replicate that at home. And that's what they have to remind people about. Yeah, but it's weird to remind people of that with one lady in an otherwise empty theater. Absolutely. Show the best clips ever. Show the first time you saw a dinosaur really live on screen. Show the computer-generated graphics of the best Pixar. And it's so easy. The Oscars do it every single year. They show way too many montages, but they're pretty much all good. Yeah, all right, all right, here's what I wrote for the picture of it. We go trick-or-treating for magic because we need that, all of us. That indescribable feeling we get when a stranger gives us candy. Not just satisfied, but somehow reborn. Together. Fun-sized chocolates in a huge pillowcase. Sweets that I can feel. Somehow, Necco wafers taste good on a night like this. That's my favorite line. <laughs> I'm laughing at my own joke. Our neighbors feel like the best part of us, and M&Ms feel perfect and powerful, because tonight, they are. It's about Halloween, the way she talks about movies. I am delighted with myself. I think I'm very funny. But <laughs> I remember when I worked at uh, Lowe's, which I think was gobbled up by AMC at some point over the years, they had the best thing before the movie started. Do you remember the Muppets singing about the movies? No, no, I don't. Okay, it was adorable, and I worked in a movie theater, so I memorized the song, and I like the Muppets, but whatever. Let's talk about Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So this is a movie that uh, is about a mild-mannered couple, John and Jane Smith. Their marriage is suffering as they find themselves unable to truly connect with one another. That's in part due to the secrets they keep from each other, specifically that they both work as secret assassins for rival organizations. When they're assigned to kill each other, their marriage is then put to the ultimate test. 
So I don't need to ask you if this was a hit. This was a big hit when it came out in 2005. Oh, yeah, this is a big hit, but uh, this was not a guaranteed hit. Uh, This went through a lot of different casts, and uh, it was going to be Nicole Kidman for a while, speaking of which. Uh, It was going to have Will Smith in it, and uh, even Gwen Stefani was considered. And, you know, it's almost, almost never a good uh, time when the leads of the film are known to be romantically involved. I don't know if it was known at the time that uh, maybe Pitt was cheating on uh, Jennifer Aniston and when he met uh, Angelina Jolie or... Oh, uh, people it, knew. I, I looked this up because I needed to refresh my memory on the timeline. Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston announced that they were separating in January of 2005. This movie came out later in 2005 and Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie were kind of coy about their relationship at first and didn't uh, come out as a couple for a while, but everyone knew. The tabloids knew that they were a real-life couple. And then people kind of hated Angelina Jolie because, remember, Jennifer Aniston, she was America's sweetheart. Everyone loves her. If Angelina Jolie is the quote-unquote other woman, you know, there was some backlash Until people saw the movie and saw the chemistry that she had with Brad Pitt and that sort of maybe turned the tide of public opinion. Well, I mean, it certainly did in terms of box office returns because uh, the film came out on June 10th, 2005. So this is a June release of a hundred ten million dollar film. And it uh, did gangbusters. It opened at number one with $50 million. And it wound up with $186 million domestically and $487 million worldwide. So, I mean, this was a huge film. Uh, you know, it's not the kind of thing that's going to make a franchise. I guess they could have milked it out for a very underperforming sequel that they would have spent $150 million on and it would have took in uh, $120 million. This is not a premise that you can uh, really stretch. There were talks about a sequel. Apparently, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt were both interested in doing a sequel but none of the pitches were good or interesting, so it just never went anywhere. Yeah, and, uh, there's going to be inevitable comparisons. Uh, a film I just kept thinking of the whole time was uh, True Lies, uh, James Cameron's film. Yeah. Uh, we haven't reviewed that film, but it's that uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Jamie Lee Curtis film. Kind of a similar premise in that Arnold Schwarzenegger plays a spy, but he's a mild-mannered uh, suburban uh, house husband, and then suddenly uh, the, the family finds out that he's a spy and everything gets mixed up Is personal life and everything and you know they're they're arguing about their marriage while they're doing gunfire it's action and comedy but that film was always talked about having a sequel forever but you know once you kind of change that dynamic it's it's just a different film you'd make the sequel like now husband and wife are together now yes that's true but isn't that also true with every superhero sequel where the first movie is the origin story that's at least hopefully Interesting. What made this person decide to become a superhero? And then in the second one, he's just beating up bad guys right from minute one. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a different story. It's- right. It's a different story. You could easily make a husband and wife superhero or rather uh, action team and just get some random screenplay and adapt it as Mr. and Mrs. Smith too. Right. And the reason we're talking about Mr. and Mrs. Smith the movie is because there is a new Mr. and Mrs. Smith show hitting Amazon Prime. And just from uh, the the one liner I saw on Wikipedia, that show is about two spies who are paired up together to impersonate a married couple. And so that is not the same story as Mr. Mrs. Smith, the movie. It's kind of similar, but it doesn't have the twist of they don't know that they're both spies. And Honestly, that premise kind of makes more sense for a TV show that they already know and they're posing as husband and wife because then they can go on adventures together and maybe they fall in love or maybe they don't or maybe they start to and then break up or who the hell knows. But you can kind of prolong that for a season or more. I'm sure they're hoping to get multiple seasons out of this. Yeah, I think the premise is right for a remake of some sort. It's it's husband and wife who don't know a secret about each other. You know, I think you could remake this over and over. Um, you know, other people in the cast, uh, you know, other than Pitt and uh, Julie, Vince Vaughn, he's a big star. And this is 2005, so Vince Vaughn is in everything. Um, there's not too much from him. I think he does exactly his job. He's supposed to be a kind of the sarcastic... Uh, 
He's aware of how ridiculous all this stuff is. But one person I want to talk about on the uh, crew is the director, um, Doug Lehman. Yeah. I love this guy. The first film he did, uh, we reviewed this film. Yes, he directed uh, Swingers with Vince Vaughn. Yeah, and I don't know if you ever saw his second film, a movie called Go. Yeah, I saw that once. Yeah, I do want to review that film. But sure. it's it's interesting that he did Swingers, which is kind of like a funny film, and then Go, which is kind of like a little bit more slick. And then his third film, uh, he directed The Born Identity. Right. And that was a slick action film. And then he winds up doing Mr. and Mrs. Smith, kind of combining all of those things. I would say this is a very slick film, but there's one other thing that he directed uh, between uh, The Born Identity and Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I don't, I don't know if you know this. What's that? But he directed the pilot of The O.C., Really? Actually, the first two episodes, um, Adam Brody's in, in this film. Right. And Adam Brody winds up being big from uh, the OC. Maybe he got it from that role. Probably. And the movie is scripted by Simon Kinberg. He's written a lot of X-Men movies, some of the ones that are considered the good ones, like uh, Days of Future Past, and also ones that are not so beloved, like X-Men colon Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix. Uh, he and Doug Lehman worked together on Jumper, that movie with Hayden Christensen. I saw that movie once and I thought it was awful. I saw that movie once and I remember liking it, but thinking it wasn't as good as it should have been. Okay, maybe. But I think the script for this movie is really, really clever because this movie has a premise that is outrageous. It's fucking insane that there are these two people who are both secret assassins and they're married to each other and they don't know it. That's got to be on the list of the most unrelatable premises ever in movies. And yet, this movie is really fucking relatable. I'll put a twist on my uh, catchphrase. As a husband, there were so, so many times in this movie I was like, Yep, I've had that fight with Courtney. I've had that conversation with my wife. We have had this exact conversation so many times. And that trick to take a premise that is really outlandish and make it feel really relatable, that is a hard thing to do. That is a hard thing to put down on paper in a screenplay. I think there are a lot of writers that try to do that and fail. And this movie, I think really, really fucking nails it. Like the, the the car chase scene, they're fleeing the bad guys and they're shooting the bad guys. So much of the things that they're bickering about are like the most common, typical things that any married couple would fight about. Uh, he says that the, the car is bulletproof and then she says that the car is bulletproof and then she gets mad that, yeah, I just said that, but you didn't hear me because you're not listening. Like, it's a joke, and, you know, I've never had that conversation with Courtney about a bulletproof car, but we've had that conversation all the time, and then she's telling him to blow up the car or shoot the car, and he's like, yeah, I will. She's like, do it. He's like, yeah, I got it, and then she just kind of pulls the emergency brake and shoots the car herself because she's just getting impatient. He's like, I've got it. She's like, yeah, any time. Like, that's really typical married couple Shit, like this is all very, very common, but in a super exaggerated, unconventional, unrealistic way. I was really impressed with the the script. When I saw this movie in 2005, I remember thinking those two have amazing chemistry. But watching it now, I was just more impressed with the, uh, the scripting. Did any of that leap out at you as a single guy? I didn't think the script was as slick as you thought. I thought that the direction was very slick. I, I actually think that the premise of the film, like you were hinting at, it's incredibly silly. True Lies, I feel like it was maybe a little bit more realistic. This film is a little bit more, I would say, reminds me of Tom and Jerry or the Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner. Okay. Especially the probably the most famous scene with the... Uh, 
uh, Julian Pitt kind of shooting it out in their own home. They're master assassins and they just can't kill each other. Because they know how to avoid assassins. Yeah, they're equally good, but it's bullets. It's not, you know. I mean, two master players at Counter-Strike are not going to never be able to kill each other. Uh, I mean, eventually they're just going to shoot, shoot each other. Well, uh, yeah, but yeah. then they get to the point where they both have a gun on each other. That's true. Fine. Uh, they, they do get there. I, I just think the film is a little bit too cartoony. Like at the end, they're both standing completely out in the open with one of my favorite shots in action films, which is both of their backs to each other and shooting outwards as the camera spins around them. It's a cool shot, but it's completely ridiculous in terms of like anyone can pick them off. Uh, it, you know, it gives the illusion that they can shoot any direction, but you know, they're just standing out in the open, but that's, that's not what's bothersome because this is a slick film where they go from like, yeah, you just tried to shoot shotguns at my head and said, you still alive, honey. And now we just dropped the guns and we have like really hot sex. It's a Hollywood thing. Just, it works in this film. I think, I think it works because of the chemistry between the two of them and it's kind of expected, but it also just kind of makes sense. I understand what you're saying about the premise being too ridiculous, but I think that for me it works because I just see this movie as a metaphor for marriage. And so all of the details work when you look at it through that lens it's fine. I, I'm again just talking about the plot of the film. Like you later find out from Adam Brody's character that, oh yes, I was never really something that had to be rescued. I was just bait to get you two. Both the rival organizations had to find out that you two were both assassins and we needed to get you two to pick each other off. What does that even mean? Like, they're going to both see each other in their sniper rifles and at the same time kill each other? Like, you find out these two people that you know where they live, like, you want them dead? Like, just send them on some Bugs Bunny mission while you're there. Put a bomb in their house. Like, it just seems so easy to kill these people that that's why I'm saying I don't think it was as clever as you think. But I don't think it's that bad because it's this kind of film. Well, I mean, I get what you're saying about the mechanics of the spy agencies and who are these spy agencies? Why are they rival agencies? How do they operate? Where do they operate? Like, a lot of the, the mechanics of that are left vague. It doesn't bother me because it's not what the movie is about. And the Adam Brody twist, I like that because I was thinking that, like, as the movie went on, I was like, what happened with that guy? What was the point of him? How are they going to work that back in? I like that reveal that it was just he was bait. Would it be easier for them to just kill them in some other less elaborate way? Sure. But it also does kind of make sense that, yeah, maybe this way only one kills the other and then one of the spy agencies still has their number one assassin and then maybe they pay a stipend to the other agency or something. Sure, that, that, that could have happened, but he could have said something like that. Instead of saying, and you take each other out, he should have said, one of you takes the other out and boom, we don't have this problem anymore. Right, and also, why is it a problem? Like, it's not a problem until they make it a problem. Um, so I, I get that. I just feel like those details they, they don't bother me because I just don't think that's what this movie is about. Also, because I just finished Archer, which was a great show and it just ended. But that's also a show about freelance spy agencies and the mechanics of how they work. You just kind of have to shrug your shoulders and go, yeah, OK, sure. Is it real? I don't fucking know. It makes enough sense, I guess, is what I'm saying. What does it mean to be rival spy agencies? They're both in America. They both live in like the suburbs of New York. Yeah. So I was thinking almost, I don't know if you ever saw the movie, uh, the show Alias. Um, no, the, but uh, I know of it. It's a Jennifer Gardner and she works for the CIA and there's this other agency, SD6. And that's like the rival, like they're like the evil spies. You know, that's the syndicate and that's the Sinister Six kind of people, uh, you know, Spectre. I just don't get, is one of them Spectre and one of them is like good guys? Like, If we're assassinating rival people, 
one of you is assassinating maybe a good person. I, I was just still just stuck on who are these people? Who are these spies? Okay, fair. I would say that maybe they answer that when they're like kind of confessing to each other all of their many secrets. One of them says, when we were at that one place, where did you go after dinner? And he says, oh, I went to kill so-and-so. And she's like, damn it, I wanted to kill him. So I think that they're both targeting the same bad guys. They're rivals because, you know, who is the CIA going to hire? Are they going to hire the company with Brad Pitt and Vince Vaughn and the little old lady? Or are they going to hire the all-female outfit that Angelina Jolie works for? It's I like, guess so. You yeah. know, I was sort of wondering at the end if there was going to be some kind of reveal of who was the mastermind, a, a big bad because there's the, the Keith David character who is father, who's in charge of Jane's agency. And then I was thinking, oh, maybe that little old lady who you think is just the sweet assistant from uh, Brad Pitt and Vince Vaughn's agency. No, she is really the boss. And they don't do that. And I think that's better. You, you don't need to have a big bad in this movie. The big bad is life. It's marriage. It's it's the, the real things that pull at married couples. And so having it just be these faceless anonymous assassins at the end i think that works perfectly fine it's funny you say that because uh there were actually two different endings that were scrapped and they actually were involving like the real heads of the agencies that kind of came forward one was angela bassett and keith david okay. they were going to be revealed as the, the big bads and another was going to be uh jacqueline Bissett and terrence stamp Okay. Um, it, but I agree with you. It doesn't really need that because it, it was all about the marriage. It, yeah. th that's the that's the point of it. It's kind of a comedy, kind of an action comedy. It doesn't need to have a general actual plot, which is the part I didn't really like about Adam Brody's character. That there was this intricate plot. I kind of more just like it that these two people. Uh oh, we were assigned the same plot, uh, the same person to assi assassinate. Um, you know, and they kind of just their lives collide. I get it. I mean, it worked for me because Adam Brody is sort of like just gone for so much of the movie that when he pops back up, it's like, oh, right, that guy. Oh, he's not a super villain because you see him in the beginning of the movie where he seems to be just like a pretty low level government employee intern or entry level whatever and so yeah why is he like this big target that they're all going to kill on like the the border of mexico that doesn't make any sense but it's not supposed to make sense because he's not a target he's bait um so i felt like that was clever enough for me uh, there's a problem i have with this film on a second viewing i mean i guess it would be the same thing on the first viewing and that we as the audience, we know the premise of what's going on. We know that they're both spies. I do think that this goes on a little bit too long. It's like get to the part where they figure it out. I think it takes a, it takes like an hour or so. No, it's 20 minutes. I wrote it down. I had it in minutes. my notes. No, th th it's 20 minutes when they figured out um, that the other one's a spy then, right? Uh, yeah. But – then later when they have like that ridiculous dinner scene, and again, ridiculous, but kind of, it's it's fascinating, ridiculous, but it's a ridiculous scene where they both know they're spies, but don't quite know they're sp like what they're, the other one's doing. And then uh, Angelina Jolie runs Brad Pitt over with his car. That scene is funny because they both know kind of, but they don't trust each other. And she hands him a drink and he's like, is this poison? But then she eats the olive, so it clearly wasn't. And they're both sussing each other out. And they want that confirmation before they kill their spouse. And then her reaction when she realizes, oh shit, no, this is real. He is that guy from that video. He is an assassin. She runs away. She leaves the house. John goes to grab his gun. And then he chases after her. And then he accidentally shoots the windshield when he kind of trips on the white picket fence and then she gets all mad like hey you shot me yeah it's outrageous but it's also just like it's an exaggerated version of a marital spat the things that i think didn't work as much were when the metaphors for the marital problems were really obvious like when it was kind of a, a flashing neon light it's really one moment when they go to the neighbor's party 
And one of the neighbors who was there with a baby at this party, which seems a little weird, but whatever, she hands the baby to Jane is like, oh, she's crying. You take her. And Jane is very uncomfortable holding the baby. I thought that was a little hitting the nail too on the head, but it does make sense that they are this attractive, childless couple. Yeah, that's exactly what the fucking neighbors are going to do. But the whole point is, if they're spies, you're supposed to be able to pretend and try to blend in. And like, it's a fucking baby. Just like, you know, pretend to like hold a baby and pretend to be like, oh, what a perfect little baby. And be Susie a uh, housewife. Like, that's what they're supposed to be. Like the scene with the dinner. I do like that. It's this elaborate dinner that she's cooking for him. And like the asparagus and everything. There's a, it's a very nice dinner that she's making for them. There's the illusion of them just living in this cul-de-sac. But she doesn't cook. It's revealed later that she hasn't ever cooked anything. It's all of like the people on her team. Well, actually, if it's all the people on her team, they're really bad at it because he makes a line like, oh, your aim is as bad as your cooking. Right, 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 right. Which at the time is a funny line because that's just like a shitty thing that a husband would say when he's fighting with his wife. Also hitting the nail on the head when they're fighting, he literally kicks her while she's down which is what married people sometimes do when they're fighting metaphorically, but he does it literally. You do have a point about uh, if she's a spy, she should be good at pretending. There are some people, though, who just don't know what the fuck to do with a baby. I'm not one of those people. You're not one of those people. But there are some people who are just completely freaked the fuck out with a baby. Also, speaking of hitting the nail on the head, did you catch the song that was playing in the background of that scene? No. It was the big hit from Amy Grant, Baby Baby. Like, okay, right, we get it, we get it. And then in the next scene when they're like in Mexico, there's like a little baby doll kind of looking at her. I was like, okay, I get it. But let me ask you, James, do you think that Mr. and Mrs. Smith stands the test of time? I think this is the sleekest film that uh, Doug Liman ever made. I think that the film is a big cartoon. I I do. I I I think you can't take it seriously. I think it's too long, to be honest. I really? think it, yeah, it's two hours. I think it's too long. I do think it takes kind of too long to get to the point. Yeah, it's interesting you say it was 20 minutes that they re- reveal it. I thought that the dinner scene, or rather the shootout in the home, was pretty quick. That was like an hour and 40 minutes into it. And it's almost no. like, no, it's like an hour and a half into it. It's it's pretty far into it. And then it just wraps up in like the uh, in the store. Because they, they quickly team up after that. And then the film yeah. kind of resolves. No, they still have the, uh, the car chase. Yeah, there's a half hour left. The film was, it was fine. Um, I, I do think it stands up. I think it's a well-made film. You know, the premise of the film was fine. I think it would work a lot better if you didn't know anything about this film. Everyone watched this film in the beginning knowing it's spies that don't know about each other, and then they do. But for me, it stands a test of time. It's fine. I didn't love the film. I have a feeling that you uh, liked it a lot more than I did. But uh, do you think this film stands the test of time? Yes, I do. And yes, I definitely did like it more than you. And I... I do wonder if part of that is because I'm married. I'm not saying that if you were married, you would have a totally different opinion. Maybe not. Maybe your opinion would be exactly the same. But I definitely saw this movie very, very differently than I did in 2005. This movie came out in June 2005. Courtney and I moved in together in July of 2005. So when I saw this movie... The entire marriage metaphor went way over my head. Watching it now, I'm like, oh, I get it. So this is about every fucking marriage. This is about all of the things that bombard married people and all of the things that can get in the way of a marriage, that attack a marriage, fighting about work, fighting about the curtains, fighting about the boring routine of life when she says dinner is at seven and he says always is like they deal with real life stuff in this unbelievable extreme version of reality i think the script is really fucking clever you know uh, after talking about a million different action movies with me i don't always love them i can get bored by, you know, just action set piece after action set piece. And I tend to think that most of the time, the scripts are pretty bad in a lot of action movies. I think this script is really fucking clever. I think it's actually 
saying something about marriage in general that you wouldn't expect from just knowing what the premise is. I think it's perfectly fair to know the premise of this movie and think, oh yeah, it's like a True Lies remake. Or, oh, okay, it's just going to be a lot of shooting and guns and explosions, but also some husband and wife banter, LOLOL. I think this movie is a lot more than that. I haven't seen True Lies in ages. I don't know how they compare, but I was really impressed with this movie. I thought it was really smart and clever, and I absolutely think it stands the test of time. What about it doesn't stand the test of time? I wrote down that there's one reference to Macy's and Gimbal's, and then John says, we're like we and the network that competes with we. Like, remember Women's Entertainment, that network? Quick, what are the networks that competed with we? Um, own. Yes. Oxygen. Yes. One more. Lifetime. Very good. Very good. Hallmark. Okay. Yeah. Hallmark too. Probably. I was thinking of, uh, own oxygen and lifetime. I can't believe I know that. <laughs> but you do know that because you lived in the era of a million cable channels and I knew people who worked at all of those networks. I know just from my days in TV, but other than that one line, it all stands the test of time. Oh, also, by the way. I talk about how much I hate voiceover all the time. The framing device in this movie, it starts and ends with them talking to a marriage counselor. And that is great. That is a great way to handle a lot of exposition in a way that is not voiceover and is far more clever. Yeah, I mean, it's your classic uh, Sopranos or uh, what was that uh, Billy Crystal one uh, that was like the, the comedy Sopranos. Um, analyze uh, this. Analyze this. Okay. You know, a psychiatrist is a great way to kind of get your inner thoughts. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, the scene when they were talking about their numbers and he says that his number is like high 50s, low 60s and her number is 342. What do you think they were talking about? I thought they meant kills. Right. But like the joke was that it was kills or sexual partners and they leave it ambiguous. I thought that was really cleverly constructed too because it could be either and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the fuck they're talking about because he's really impressed with his number and his number is a fraction of her number. Does it matter if it's kills or sexual partners or millions of dollars they have tucked away? He feels emasculated. The number is what's funny. The what they're counting doesn't matter at all. Well, it's also he's saying a vague number. He's saying 50s, 60s, and she says 342. Right. So it's, it's you know, it's more a little serious for her. Right. And then she says some were two at a time. So it's kind of leaning into the, it's probably about sexual partners. It just No, she shot two people. The bullet went two people at once. It works either way. It works either way. And so it's funny. But next week, we're not just going to talk about marriages. Well, maybe we will. But my wife, my Mrs. Smith, will be here in the flesh. Courtney Noah is going to join us for our Valentine's Day episode. We're going to talk about Always, starring Richard Dreyfuss. Have you ever seen this? No, it's one of the uh, Steven Spielberg films I've never seen. Okay, I had never seen it when I mentioned to Courtney that I hadn't ever seen it. She gave me a what? But we will watch it and we will talk about it next week. In the meantime, we want to hear your thoughts about Mr. and Mrs. Smith, about Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, about assassins and spy agencies and marriages and all of it. We are at Test of Time Pod on Facebook, X, Instagram, and Threads. Whatever podcast platform you listen to us on, subscribe, like, make sure you never miss an episode. And we'll see you next time, everybody. Bye.